Issue 19, The Antagonist. Most people think of the antagonist as the bad guy. They're the character that does all the evil things that Joe Hero has to stop, right? Well, not always. An antagonist isn't inherently evil. There's no rule that says they have to put a top hat and curly mustache on every morning and go out to punch orphans. Sure, they can do those things if it fits with the plot in their character arc, but it's not required. The antagonist at its base is just a character who acts as a reverse main character. For everything our protagonist does, the antagonist should be doing something that drives them both towards conflict. This means that the antagonist and protagonist could both be relatable, lovable characters who just happen to be fighting over something. Sure, sure, it's much easier to make them evil. When they're evil, they can just do things because they're evil. Stab someone? Because evil. Sabotage something? Because evil. Burn down an orphanage? You guessed it, because evil. But why? This is the biggest problem with antagonists. They aren't usually treated as a character. They're treated as a sort of evil bucket that just dumps evil around the plot to get the conflict started. This leads me to my first point. Relatable antagonists create better conflict. If your big bad guy lives alone in a mountain kicking puppies all day, then nobody cares when he falls headfirst into a volcano. However, if he's a family man with a young daughter and he donates to a butterfly reserve, it'd be a shame if he got pushed into that lava flow. Conflict isn't measured by how cool the swords are, but by what's at stake for each character. When your antagonist is just a bucket of evil, then your story tension will only be operating at half power because you only have half the stakes. However, if your antagonist is relatable, with things to fight for and things to lose, then the reader knows that no matter who wins, something important is going to be lost. But let's say you know all this. You have a character with his own goals, his own reasoning, his own butterfly supporter card. What's next? Well, you should probably make your antagonist competent. Let's say your villain is murdering swaths of orphans with his infinite power glove just because there's not enough grape soda to go around. Little six-year-old Sally could point out that, like, maybe he should just use his infinite power to buy more soda instead of murdering everybody? Seems kind of simple, doesn't it? Yet when it comes to writing, authors tend to bend over backwards in order to keep their antagonist firmly ensconced in the bad guy camp. They want Big Purple over there to be mean and unstoppable, but finding a good reason to keep him mean and unstoppable is kind of difficult sometimes. Which is why you shouldn't lock your antagonist into that gotta be evil cage. Instead, it's a lot easier to just give them goals that cannot be completed unless the protagonist fails. Sure, they can play nasty along the way, but they should do so out of reason, desperation, passion, etc. All in response to the stakes they are fighting for. Survivors fighting over food, sports teams competing over top place, a lawman chasing a law-breaking vigilante. These are all classic conflicts because both sides have a logical reason to be in conflict with each other. They work because evil should be a choice, not a plot point. Having the possibility of your antagonist being good, of winning straight, of reaching his goals without compromising his integrity, then breaking away from that path shows that he's not just a bucket. He's a hero who could have been. Thanks for listening, and good words to you all.